Hello, everyone, and then um, welcome to another session of the Hawaiian Distinguished Lecture Series. It's always is a series of lectures that informs, educates, trains to ensure um, the skill set of the professional is greatly increased. Um, today, we privilege to have another one of our own. It's Kwame Welfare is a professor of mining engineering from Missouri SNT. He's going to talk to us about what we all need most and what the industry needs most and what most people are lacking. Um, Kwame is well based on this subject. He's been doing this for a long period of time across various jurisdictions. Thank, thank you all for joining this one. I'm it's a pleasure to do this. Um, as Lauren says, I do training around um, reserves resource reporting in various jurisdictions. And um, I've actually, I think why um, I did a course on resource reserve classification in Tagra a few years uh, back. So I've done one in Ghana before, and hopefully this is valuable, even though this is a really short uh, webinar. Normally, um, you would like to introduce uh, yourself just just to tell people uh, you have credibility to teach the subject. Um, as Lauren said, I'm a professor at SNT in mining and engineering. But perhaps the um, and then I also do some consulting on the side, and I do training through through my consulting business. But um, of all these things listed here perhaps the most important piece of experience um, with regards to this is the fact that in uh, 2015 uh, to 16, I was the um, Mining Engineering Academic Fellow at the US Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, so my, my period on sabbatical was spent at the commission helping rewrite the US rules on um, resource reserve reporting or mining, mining um, property disclosure as a whole. Of course, as part of that, you, you end up having to study all the rules around the world, comparing them to the US rules and trying to understand why um, the choices we were making in writing the rules for the US were, were the best choices given, given our context. Um, and so that's, that's perhaps the most relevant experience. I also, chaired the YM committee that wrote the YM, YM rules. So I have quite a bit of experience. And then since then, I've done training um, on, the, on the US rules in particular. I've done training um, for you know, lots of people, um, either through the university, through my consultant. Um, and it's been mixed groups, either open courses where everybody attends all for, for specific companies, um, done training for Rio Tinto, done training for Vale. Um, beside the people who've just attended, these are companies that have contracted me specifically to do training for them um, and done consulting work where people, consultants, mining companies call and we spend time on, on the phone or on Zoom, uh, educating them about the rules and or answering specific questions. So. Hopefully that convinces you that I have the, I have something to share and I'm hoping you learn something from this. Um, but then at, at this point, I would also like to know the group a bit and know who we are dealing with and uh, the level of experience. Uh, so I don't know if we are ready with the first poll and can share the first two questions. If we can, that would be great that this would be a good time to get a sense of who the group is. Am I, are we ready to share the poll or maybe I can go on and come back to this question later? Okay. So we've shared the question in, in the chat. Um, if, you are, if you are able to just um, give us 
a one or a two or a three on, on the chat so we can get a sense of who is on the call. So you know what, given how slow the responses are coming in, um, if you if you have responses, just just type them in. I'll come back and check it later. Um, I'm going to move on. So we, in the interest of time, we use we use the time we have um, uh, well. Um, but already based on the few answers I've seen, I think as usual, and this is not um, unusual at all, where one of these courses you find out there's a, there's a whole breadth of um, experience. So I have people that have said so far that they have multiple years experience, 16, 25 years experience doing this in several jurisdictions. And then we have people too that have no experience. So hopefully the people with a lot of experience, you would be patient as we try to help those that don't have a lot of experience. And those are the lower end of the experience scale. Um, sometimes we might move faster because we cannot um, try to slow it down because there are people as you see who have lots of experience um, who would find that um, uh, too rudimentary if we we go too slow of a space a, a pace. So, thank you all for giving me a sense. If you haven't typed in, I think it's okay because I, I get the sense. That's that's a big picture. I was trying to confirm that we have um, broad range of experience on this call, or that everybody is very experienced. But it seems, as I suspected, we have broad range of experience. Okay, so my hope is that. Um, by the time we get to the end that all of us have a better appreciation of what the best practices are in annual reporting of mineral resources and reserves. Um, you may know these best practices already, but it might be good to just um, do a refresher and also to hear from fellow professionals in the industry uh, what they think the best practices are. Um, I have this sort of broken down into three uh, sections. The third topic is something I just added, even though it wasn't specifically in the original request. Um, and if we don't have the time, I might just not do that. But I think production target reports and depending on the company um, can also fall um, or actually does fall within the realm of what QPs are supposed to do to provide information to management. And so I thought we might discuss that a bit, but the, the first two items are mainly what we are trying to do is just on a very brief basis, review um, the definitions of what a resource and reserve is. Not that um, anybody does not know that, but I think it's good to just get a refresher so we are all on the same page uh, when we discuss these things. Um, and then we will actually dig into the um, ASX JOG. I made that assumption to go with ASX and JOG because I think most of the um, professionals, all that at least the West African industry at this point is dominated by companies that are listed on the ASX. Um, but as you would probably know that these rules are not that different from one jurisdiction to the other. Um, and obviously for me personally, I do know the US uh, environment quite well. I'm also quite well versed in uh, 43101 or the Canadian standard um, and then and then JOG. So if, if we have questions around that, and I'm sure if you have questions about the South African environment, I'm sure there's someone on, the, on this call that can share their experience. Um, and so I'll then get into the specifics 
of ASX and JOG uh, reporting requirements. And as I explain those requirements along the way, I would be sharing my thoughts on what best practices are. So that's the, that's the plan. And if we have the time, I would go into the production target reporting and again, share what I believe to be best practices. Um, and then at the end, we'll have some time for discussion. As we go along, there will be times I will pause and, and, and see if we can get some interaction going. So at those points, uh, you can provide feedback either by um, raising your hand if you know how to, and then we can open them, let you open the mic and, and speak uh, at that point. So that's the plan uh, for the for the day. Hopefully, all of you have seen this figure or a figure like this before, which is most of the very basic concept of the relationship between exploration results and information resources and reserves. So uh, the basic 101 of this is we take exploration data, exploration results, we do work on them to establish geology continuity. And in that process, end up with an estimate of what mineral resources are. And I'll show you what the um, technical definition of mineral resources are in, in a moment. But once we define mineral resources, we are required to then classify them into inferred, indicated, and measured. Um, and when we are ready to then convert those mineral resources into mineral reserves, we conduct a feasibility study where we evaluate uh, or apply and evaluate the mod what we call modifying factors, um, which are listed down here. Let me try and pull. Modifying factors. So we we apply and evaluate these modifying factors to the indicated and measured. And if we end up with an economically viable project, then the indicated or the portion of the indicated and measured, which end up in the mine, whether surface or underground, we can then classify them as uh, pro proved probable, proven probable, depending on, on the jurisdiction. Now, where in cases where the uncertainty surrounding these modifying factors, when we apply them to measured, are not um, at the high enough confidence, then we downgrade measured into probable reserves. So hopefully this is something that you're familiar with because this is the very basic part of what we do. Um, I'm showing here the YM code uh, as well as the JOC definition for mineral resources. Um, you will find regardless of which one you use and, and, and whatever the differences in language may be that in the end, these definitions are quite similar and they, were, they are designed to be so. This is why um, Crisco has worked hard to, to bring in jurisdictions from around the world to end up with similar templates so that what is a re resource in, in Canada is a resource in Ghana and it's a resource in South Africa and Australia. And we don't end up with different definitions. So they're designed to be different. A big part of one of the things that I want, I, personally, I think QP should focus on is that a resource is that which has reasonable prospects of eventual economic extraction. That is important that as a QP, as a geologist, if you're going to say something is a mineral resource, you are saying that it has prospects of economic extraction. It is then, then important to understand that a resource has some economic aspect. It is not just an inventory of mineral, mineral uh, mineralization or an inventory of material um, for, for whatever reason. A resource has some preliminary economic relation, not that it's the same as a feasibility study, but when you say something is a resource, you are saying that it has prosperous economic extraction Different QPs will have different ways of saying that. So in the case of surface, some might do a pitch shell, a preliminary pitch shell and the things that appear in that pitch shell. Not that they will do a mine design around that pitch shell, but they will do a pitch shell to establish reasonable prospects of economic extraction. Some might not. If you do not and it's surface, you have to have a means of establishing a reasonable depth at which it is no longer resource. 
Um, but whatever you do, it is because you are trying to get to the point where you are saying that these have reasonable prospects of economic extraction. Other QPs might just rely on a, on a cutoff grade. And in the case of something like coal, rely on a, a stripping, a break even stripping ratio analysis. But whatever you do, my point is, it is important to recognize that something is a resource because it has reasonable prospects of economic extraction. The other part, which is the next sentence right after the reasonable prospect in the definition is the fact that a resource estimate is the location. That's the part that I think oftentimes we don't think about that normally when we state the resource, we are stating the quantity and grade and of course, we expect that we know we have established continuity. I said that earlier, because to me, the, the ability to establish grade and geologic continuity is what dif differentiates we are at the mineral resource state versus when we are just at the exploration results stage. When we are just reporting exploration results, these are data from the deposit and we have not yet defined geologic and grade continuity. When we come to the resource stage, we have done that, we should have done that. So those are important as a QP, that whether you think you have done that or not, when you say something is a mineral resource, by definition, you would also be saying you have established geologic continuity, you have established grade continuity, and that there are reasonable prospects of economic extraction. And then we typically will state the quantity and a grade but remember, you are also saying you know where it is. It's important because, for example, in the case of an underground mine, if we think we have some resource there, but we don't know where exactly the resource is, it's still not, the, the level of uncertainty is too high, right? Because we need to be able to plan for stops and we rely on our resource estimate to be accurate to the extent that when it says this is where the resource is, that there's reasonable expectation that the resource is actually in that vicinity. So that's an important thing to, to, to notice on the, on the definition of what is a resource. Um, of course, there are definitions for the classes of resources inferred, measured, uh, inferred, indicated and measured, but they will take too much time for us to review that as well. So, uh, I'm going to jump ahead to, to reserves. And again, I show here the Waim definition and the JOC uh, definition. And in both definitions, um, and I'm not going to read the definitions. I, 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 I'm sure you can read it. So there's no point in me uh, reading it uh, again. But the things that I want to point out is both definitions say economically, um, mineable, economically viable, um, whatever the, the, the term, depending on which code, but these two codes you use economically mineable. So that's important to note that whereas a resource just has prospects of eventual economic extraction, um, a reserve has been demonstrated to be economically mineable. And we demonstrate that with a study that is at least at the pre-feasibility level, right? And again, we could have another conversation as to what constitutes a pre-feasibility study and both the YM code and the JOC code define what is a pre-feasibility study. But for us to say something is a, is a mineral reserve, we are saying that we have done a study to the level at least of a pre-feasibility study and that study has demonstrated that the measured and indicated, which become the basis of a resource uh, reserve estimate, um, have been demonstrated to be economically mineable. Um, so those are the key um, parts of the definition that I was hoping um, to, to revise or to refresh in your mind um, as we enter into the conversation about um, annual reporting. I will stop here and see if there are any questions or comments before I proceed. Okay, here in Anna, I would proceed.
then because uh, mainly because we have people are expected that we will have people that have no experience with uh, reports and I wanted to provide this background too because it's important in where we are going to go in a moment that if you look at any any country that has a long history of mining or, or does have mining companies listed on the stock exchanges the way to think about all the, the regulatory environment, the way to think of the regulatory environment is typically the country would have some sort of securities law that governs how you can sell securities, mainly stock in the case of mining, but it's not just stock, stocks, bonds, things that companies or uh, private companies offer to the general public to invest in them. Um, so there would be, the country would have some law that governs um, the process of selling securities in the in the in the country. So in the US, for example, you have the 33 Act and the 34 Act, which are the US securities law, which came right after the uh, stock market crash of the 1930s. Um, and and other countries do have their own laws. And and so those are law, right? Companies that are listed on stock exchanges have to follow those laws. And those laws also govern the exchanges themselves. So in, in the case of the United States, the, the US securities laws cover the exchanges like NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange and so on and so forth. And this is the same in Canada. So for example, in Canada, 43101 is national law. And 43101 is therefore binding on the Toronto Stock Exchange and, and all the other stock exchanges. But beyond the the securities law themselves, I'm also throwing in the listing rules of the stock exchanges. So each of the stock exchanges would also have listing rules where companies that are listed on the stock, that particular exchange are required to follow those, those rules. So I'm adding in the listing rules and the, the national law, all our securities law that companies have to follow. Typically, those laws would require that companies that are listed on these exchanges provide periodic reporting, uh, which is more frequent than annual reporting, but also provide annual reporting. So these companies are subject, and this is not only for mining companies, okay? This is for all companies. So Alphabet and um, Facebook and any company that is listed, listed on a stock exchange uh, is obligated to provide an annual report and periodic report, whether that's quarterly report or even more periodic reports to the market on material events. So companies are subject to these laws, regardless of whether they are mining companies or not. Under a subset of these rules would be what one might consider property disclosure. Property disclosure is required for all companies. So for example, General Motors or Ford are required to provide, provide property disclosure on their factories because those factories are deemed material to investors. Investors need to understand what's going on on those properties because those properties are, uh, as you imagine, if you're an investor in Ford, you would want to understand the capacity of those factories and what liabilities exist around those factories, so on and so forth. So property disclosure is one of the things that the annual report or periodic report should cover when providing information to the market. If you're a mining company, then your property disclosure includes information about the mining properties. In fact, if you read any mining companies um, um, annual report, you would see information about say the headquarters, for example, because the headquarters is a property and they would provide information about that property. But clearly the most important properties that um, investors in mining companies are looking for is the mining properties, right? That's, that's the crux of the matter. And when you are providing mining property disclosure, exploration results, mineral resources, mineral reserves on those properties are also deemed material information. Again, if you think even of yourself, if you're going to invest in a mining company and you care about the mining properties and you care about the mining properties uh, and you care to know whether they only have exploration results and what kind of exploration results they have, 
but if they do have mineral resources, then how much mineral resources do they have? Is that inferred? Is that indicated? Is that measured? And if they have mineral reserves, same questions, right? So this is how we come to the point where mining companies are required to provide this sort of disclosure. I say all of that to, to, for the benefit of those that don't have experience as to why these reports are generated. Because if your company is listed on the stock market, they are obligated to provide these, these disclosures uh, to the market, at least in the, once a year in the annual report. And this is what brings us here today. Now, again, I could use, in fact, in my, in my training course, I, I use it depending on who is in the course, I would use the Canadian example or the US example to illustrate. But because we are sticking with JOC and, and the ASX, I'm using that here. So in, in Australia, there's the General Australian Securities Law, which is government law passed by parliament. Um, and then you have the Australian stock exchanges listing rules, which are binding on any company that is listed on the Australian stock exchange. If you then look at chapter five of, of the ASX listing rules, which I have on my, my laptop here, chapter five deals with mining property disclosure specifically. So chapter five is where mining and oil and gas entities should be looking for instructions on property disclosure. Okay, and we, I will show you portions of chapter five today. Most of our conversation today comes out of chapter five of the Australian Stock Exchange listing rules. Now, JOG is binding on companies listed in Australia, not because JOG has any power, because really JOG is a professional association, much like WAIM has written its code. And we are hoping that at some point, the WAIM code is binding on someone. But at this point, the WAIM code is binding on no one primarily because the stock exchange in Ghana has not adopted the YM code the way the ASX has adopted JOC, right? So the reason JOC is binding is that the ASX listing rules incorporates JOC as Appendix 5A of the listing rules. And as we go through Chapter 5, you will notice that several times it says that if you're reporting resources or reserve, it must be done in accordance with chapter five, uh, appendix 5A. And of course, appendix 5A is indeed JOC. It's just JOC copied and pasted um, as appendix 5A. So, so this is how, whether that is JOC or, or the Canadian 43101, 43101 has very similar language where in 43101, which again is national law, in 43101, it says that the terms resources and reserves have the meaning ascribed to them by the CIM standard, hence the power of the CIM standards. The CIM standards by themselves would have no power except that 43101 incorporates the CIM standards by reference by saying that reserves and resources have the meaning ascribed to them by the CIM standards. Therefore, if you're going to say something is a resource or a reserve, it must follow what the CIM standards say. So this is the general framework and you see that framework repeated, whether you are in Canada or in Australia or, 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 or in the United States that we make these professional society rules and then the, the stock exchange or the national law incorporates those rules and therefore it becomes binding on companies that are listed on, on those exchanges. So, with that, I'm going to transition into the, um, the annual reporting requirements. But again, I'll stop here and see if anyone has questions or comments before I move on. Um, Kwame, I think we can um, get the questions done after the lecture. What do you think? Yeah. Well, maybe in the in this, I have a couple of questions here. So I would. So there is one question on in which jurisdiction does the YM code apply? I think I already answered that question. Um, Lawrence and I, and I know many people involved, have been working to see. Primarily, you know, Lawrence has been the one pushing a lot to see if we can get it incorporated um, by the stock exchange in Ghana, um, and whether the Minerals Commission would incorporate that in its rules. At this point, it doesn't have the, the authority of law yet, uh, except that if you are a member of WAIM, um, 
on a professional ethical standard, it's binding because the ethical standards of WAIM are binding on its members, right? So you cannot, for example, be involved in a scam where you say something is a resource when it's not indeed a resource. And if you are accused of that, the WAIM code will be what we will use to evaluate whether you did, um, you, you acted ethically or not. Um, so th to the extent, that's about the only thing it, it, um, it applies to at this point that is binding on YA members in, in, in evaluating whether you're acting ethically and professionally as a mining professional. Um, I think someone had their hand raised. Okay, moving on. So let's get into the annual report. And again, this is, you would see me from this point quote directly from the chapter five of the ASX listing rule. So this is 5.21 5 of the ASX listing rules. Um, um, clearly states that a mining entity must include mineral resources and reserves um, in its annual report. So if your company is listed on the Australian Stock Exchange, by this rule, its annual report should include resources and reserves um, in, its, in its annual report, right? Uh, it also requires that the, the entity does an annual review of the oil reserves and mineral resources so I think this is the title of this presentation, um, that on an annual basis, mining entities listed on the ASX are required to review their oil reserve and therefore provide an update when there are changes to the market. Uh, and this is typically done at the end of the fiscal year. So depending on, the, on whether the entity is a December 31, uh, reporting company as in their fiscal year ends December 31 or their fiscal year ends in June or July, depending on where your company's fiscal year ends, there is this requirement for, for there to be a review of the oil reserves and, and mineral resources um, and to provide an annual report, uh, which includes a review of these resources. And there are multiple things required and we'll be digging into. But, but the first point to make is that the company is required to provide an annual report um, of its mineral resources and reserves. It needs a review of those resources and reserves. So you cannot have resources and reserves disclosed on the ASX and never review them at the end of the year. You are required to review them and to update that. And part of the update is these things that we have listed here on this, um, on this page. So, what are some things to take note of? Um, the rules require view of the resources at the end of the fiscal year. This can become challenging as some of you who are involved in this know, um, because typically timelines become important because um, companies, once their fiscal year ends, typically have you know, up to three months or so to provide their report to the, to the stock exchange. And so there's usually a crunch time at the end of the fiscal year to update all these things. And unfortunately, these things are linked. There's typically exploration going on. There's resource estimation being done by the geology group. And then the mining group is waiting for those models to be completed or updated so they can do mine planning and come up with reserve estimates. So the timeline for review makes, makes it very challenging. And we need to acknowledge that. And at the same time, there has been production, right? So the mine has changed, there's been production, surfaces have changed. So we need to bring in the new surfaces. We need to reconcile the production with, with the new estimates. And there are other um, concerns or other challenges that perhaps I haven't brought up, but make this exercise challenging. And hopefully uh, we can share experiences today on this and, and learn from each other. And some of the challenges we just can't change. Um, the rules require that we provide disclosure at the end of the fiscal year and the timelines are what the timelines are. The question is how can we best do this 
given given the constraints and the challenges. Then if I move on, these are more uh, rules. And again, I'm not going to read through these rules. I'm going to highlight certain aspects that I think are important. So um, you see here that there is allowance to report on another date other than the fiscal year. But if you do, you need to provide any material changes. In fact, this rule, in my opinion, is, is still even applicable in cases where you plan to report, let's say your fiscal year ends December 31, and the plan is to report the, the resource resource estimates at December 31, but that report doesn't come out till say February. And in the meantime, something material happens, something big happens. It's important to provide some discussion on the fact that even though these estimates are based on December 31 estimates, in the meantime, since we prepared this estimate, this and that has happened, which is likely to affect these results. Investors deserve an explanation. If you don't provide that kind of explanation, that can get the company in trouble. Um, and I don't know Australia particularly that well as far as litigation is concerned, but in the US and Canadian market, companies get sued all the time for not providing good disclosure. Not only do the companies get sued the, by, by investors, but the government, the regulators do take the companies, companies on for not providing material information. In fact, in my other course recently, one of the examples I showed this, the participants was um, um, uh, a Rio Tinto acquisition in, uh, in Mozambique where Rio Tinto paid money for the mine in Mozambique. And then according to the SEC, the US SEC, my former employer's um, um, case in court, the SEC alleges that Rio executives were quickly made aware that the resources and reserves were not as much as they had paid for, and therefore the mine was not worth as much as it was worth. Uh, and instead of Rio disclosing that information to the market and writing the asset down, they did not. Um, or that's the allegation anyway. And therefore investors lost money because the, the asset value was inflated for a period. That's the kind of stuff that happens when investors are not informed of what the update shows, right? So if there are material information that, or there is material information that comes up, it's important to disclose that. Having made that first point, in fact, the second point is more what I wanted to focus on on this slide, which is that as part of this annual report of resources and reserves, the ASS listing rules require that the mining company do a comparison of the previous year's um, estimates to this year's estimates. So let's say you're working, as I, I suspect some of you are working, you're working on estimates for 2020, and therefore you're going to close on December 31st, assuming that's where you close and say, this is the reserves and resources we had as of December 31, 2020. This requirement is saying, then you compare that number or the numbers you got for this at the end of December 30, 31, 2020, to the numbers you had at the end of December 31, 2019, right? So you're comparing the current estimates to the previous year's estimate because investors need to know what has changed, how much has changed in your, in your reserves holdings. And you notice here that you're supposed to compare them by commodity type, including the grade or quality. So if say the mine has gold and, and silver, you have to provide estimates of resource uh, if you provide contained metal you provide to prov you're expected to provide the gold and um, silver estimates it is also important to notice here um, that this is for the whole company so the company might have different mines and these numbers are rolled up but even if the numbers are rolled up it's important to be able to report so for say a bhp to report uh, gold holdings and copper holdings and, and report all these particular commodities and compare the reserve numbers be before uh, the, in the previous year as well as the current year. This other point is important to notice that the company is required to report material changes in the resources uh, uh, and reserves. And we will have some conversation about what constitutes material changes, but it is important to to think about materiality 
And all these rules, the YM rules, the JOC rules, require that they are based on three principles, materiality, transparency, and competency. Competency, which is accounted for by the QP's qualification. But we hopefully all know what transparency means, that when we do write a report, it's important to be transparent and not hide information from investors. And materiality has speaks to the idea that assumptions, facts that are material should be disclosed. So for instance, in the US setting, the liability that qualified persons as they are called in the US. So I know some of you are used to the term competent persons. Um, I'm using them interchangeably because some of the rules in the industry use competent persons and some of the rules use qualified persons. But, but in the US, qualified persons are liable or investors can sue you for two things. Of course, they can sue you even if they are wrong, but, but if they will be successful, there are two things they can sue you for. is the omission of a material fact. So if something was material and it was omitted from the report, you can get sued. And the second thing would be that a material fact is misstated. Um, so if you misstate a material fact, or sometimes that's just referred to as a material misstatement or the omission of a material fact, those are the two things you can be sued on. And it's important to understand that when there are material changes in the resources and reserves, there needs to be an explanation for what constitutes material changes. So based on those comparisons, I have a few thoughts here on, on, on the best practices. One being um, uh, we need to be able to understand the sources of differences uh, in resources. These are some examples of things that can cause differences between the previous year and this year. Um, sometimes we do produce resources. So to the extent that resources have been produced, that could change the resource numbers. We might have changed our price assumptions or cost assumptions in, in the resource estimation stage. We may have new exploration results that change our resources. And sometimes we do make changes in the methods that we are using. And of course, there could be others that uh, some of the experienced people on this uh, call can add to the list. Similarly, uh, differences in reserves could also be the result of production or depletion. Um, changes in the resource model could cause a change in the reserve model, right? The resource estimate has changed, therefore we do new mine plans and we end up with a new reserve estimate. Price and cost assumptions are even more important at the reserve stage. Uh, new exploration results um, could now, let me make the point to here that our price assumptions should not be spot prices. So we don't use today's price so that every small change in gold prices should, should result in a change in the reserve. We are supposed to use what we believe to be the long-term price of the commodity. So sometimes changes in prices, spot prices, do not result in any change in our resource reserve estimates because we believe that our long-term estimates, price estimates are still valid. Um, and again, new exploration results to the extent that new exploration results need lead to an update in the resource model, then they, they could also affect the, the reserve estimates. Um, and then changes in relevant modifying factors. So if something changes, for example, on the permitting side, which affects how big my pit can be or whether I can mine underground through a certain part of the, uh, of the deposit, that can also affect what my, my, um, my reserve estimates come to be. And, and of course, there could be more examples of factors that lead to changes in reserves. So some best practices here. Please do evaluate whether the changes are material changes or not. Um, and flag that after pull, even if you are not the one doing all of the work, that to flag that up with your supervisor is a good practice. Um, what is material would, I cannot sit here and tell you exactly what would be material because it really it depends on the facts and the circumstances. Uh, but do consider the amount of the change as well as the reason for the change. Um, production and depletion would never really ever be material. Changes in resource reserve estimates because we are producing in my mind is never a material fact. Not, not that you should not disclose the change, but that should not lead to a big discussion on materiality. 
a producing mine is expected to produce reserves. So if it produces reserve, nothing strange has happened. But the, the uh, other factors could become material. And this point here that the amount of the change as well as the reason for the change is important. I do remember this conversation very well when I was in the commission. There was one of the accountants that everybody agreed that among the accountants, he was uh, the most knowledgeable when it comes to mining because the group I worked in, in the commission was responsible for reviewing, uh, actually the group's name was apparel beverages and mining. So they reviewed beverages, which would be companies like Coca-Cola, Pepsi and the like. Then they reviewed apparel companies like Marshalls. These are stores here that sell um, clothing and stuff. And then they reviewed mining companies and, and we don't ask me why that was the case. And so they had broad expertise within the group is my point, but everybody agreed that this guy, James was like the leading expert when it came to mining companies. And so I remember going to James one time and say, okay, explain to me once again, how you guys evaluate materiality in the financial statements. And we had a long conversation, but one of the things he said to me in that conversation is, you know, a few dollars here in the financial statement, if we are off by a few dollars, that's not an issue. But if the reason the company is hiding the few dollars is because we are covering up an affair by the CEO, that's a material fact because the reason for the change suddenly becomes a material fact. So small changes might not be material on their own, but if the reason for the change is one that investors would want to know, then suddenly that becomes a material fact. And that's what I mean by most engineers, because we are engineers and numbers are our thing, we tend to focus on, oh, has the, the, has the number changed? You know, I changed something here and the number has changed big time. So now it's a material change. While the quantity does matter, if you have changes upwards of 10%, you should be really starting to think about are those material changes and should I flag that up with someone? But beside the quantity, the reason for the change is also important to consider. So if assumptions that are stated in the publicly disclosed documents, so in the case of ASX, that would be the table one, the JOC table one disclosure. If assumptions that are disclosed in the JOC table one are significantly changing, which is what is leading to the change, then we need to start evaluating whether we consider that a material change or not. So those are some of the best practice tips around uh, reconciliation um, disclosure that I would want to point out. I want to give a case study here just to um, make this more practical. I don't know how many of you have heard of Rubicon Minerals. Rubicon is an interesting case. Uh, Rubicon published the PEA in Canada. So PEA is a preliminary economic assessment. And so the PEA is not a pre-feasibility study. So the, the estimates are still mineral res resources. So they did a PEA, which is not a pre-feasibility study. And instead of going to the stage of a pre-feasibility study, uh, they decided that the, the pre-feasibility study was not necessary. Uh, this was an underground project. And to get to pre-feasibility, they probably would have had to do some more drilling. Um, they were able to raise money of the market and also from some major investors uh, with just the PEA and went ahead and started the mine. Um, I have this article here from the Financial Post with that title, What Went Wrong at Rubicon. It's a good one uh, if you're interested in, in reading. Um, and so they started a project and then immediately started encountering problems about the definition of the resources and where the resources were in the mine. Uh, in 2016, they essentially were forced because of the many problems to come back to the market with new disclosure on their mineral resources. And I'm going to show you a table here. Um, I had to break it up into three slides. I'm going to show you a table here that the company itself shares in their 2016 disclosure on the differences. And this is an attempt to say these are material changes and as a company, we are reporting these material changes. So this is what I'm trying to get across with, if there are material changes, 
somebody needs to flag it up the pole so that it gets disclosed to the market. Of course, with Rubicon, <laughs> the problems were big enough that this is not somebody flagging it out. I mean, everybody was aware that they were having issues at this mine. So I'll leave these slides up for a bit so we can all soak it in um, and see, I mean, just line or row by row the, the differences that existed between the 2013 estimate and the 2016 estimate. So clearly on the basis of the information available, if you look at what, and SRK, by the way, is the consulting company that did the, both the 2013 estimate and the 2016 estimate. And clearly you see that based on the additional information available, what they missed was that the, the geology was much more complex than they had anticipated or assumed it to be in the, in the early stage. This is an issue here that gets geologists in trouble all the time, the, the strategy you use for capping. So notice how high the outlier limits were in the 2013 estimate as compared to the 2016 estimates, which of course leads to significant reduction in the grade and contained metal. Uh, but sometimes that's actually what is more realistic rather than just relying on um, high numbers in the data set. And I, I will send the slide to the set of slides to YM um, so that it can be distributed to those who registered. But so you can you can go to this link and read this this article too. But but the point I'm making here is you realize that in the 2016 estimate there was much more conservative assumptions than there were in the 2013 estimate. And this was being forced on them because the reality of trying to produce out of that resource made it clear that those assumptions in the 2013 estimate were wrong, right? And so once those assumptions have changed, of course, investors need to be updated with the new numbers. In this case, it resulted in significantly less resources than the 2013 estimate. So the quantity changed significantly but the, the nature of the assumptions are also material assumptions. And so both, in this case, both the, the reasons as well as the, the magnitude of the change were important and therefore um, deserving of an update to the market. Of course, this happened over a three year period, but this could also happen in your annual, um, things can happen in a one year time frame as well. So I don't know if we are able to do polling now, but I have an exercise here to sort of um, get us going. Um, so the, the exercise is posed that ABC Mining has disclosed 50 million tons of reserves. 
with an additional 2 million tons of inferred resources in the open pit boundary. So there's 15 million tons of reserves in the open pit. Of course, if it's not in the pit, you couldn't call it reserves. And then there are an additional 2 million tons of inferred that is also within the pit boundaries, right? The mine plan projected production of 1 million tons of reserves and 200,000 tons of inferred in the current fiscal year. Um, however, uncertainty surrounding the estimate resulted in the mine having to produce 50% more reserves. So in this case, for the 2 million, you had to produce 3 million tons in order to obtain the budgeted metal um, production. Uh, the, ABC, the, the company staff have been working to understand the geology better, leading to re revisions in resources and, and reserves. So the question, the first question would be, um, if you are the supervising QP, would this represent material changes? Um, I don't know that we actually have a real poll set up yet, so um, okay. So maybe you type your answer in the in the chat, and I see our first answer is up as yes. Um, of course. Okay, let's see some answers. We have almost 70 people, so let me see if I can get 10 answers before going on. So actually, there's an interesting comment here um, that says, yes, including resort re inferred in production is not appropriate. Um, so in feasibility studies, we are required to treat inferred as waste They're not used inferred in the, in the economic viability assessment, right? But inferred, if inferred is in the pit, routinely we do produce inferred. I mean, if the pit is already economic and we know there is some um, inferred in there with estimated grade, we do produce it. Um, and, and so what would be wrong if that 200,000 that they plan to produce was used in the economic analysis for the feasibility study, but it is not wrong to produce inferred. Now, hopefully I, that distinction is clear. Um, they can produce in fed, it's their material, it's their deposit, they can produce whatever they want. Um, and in fact, when we get to the production target discussion, if you do include in fed in production target, then you need to provide all these um, disclosure of uh, caution, caution around it. But, but companies sh can and routinely do produce in fed resources but you don't use inferred in economic analysis to say that something is profitable to produce. Okay, given the answers I get, I think mostly everybody agrees this is material. Um, and then the second question would be, if you deem these changes to be material, what specific factors would you attribute the change to? So I don't know if we can post that question also uh, on the in the chat and then see what answers we get on the second question. There were some possible answers with that question too. Can we post the possible answers? So I believe that uh, some of the things to think about is, um, yeah, let's see if we...
Okay, okay, so I'm getting some um, good, good answers in the chat. Okay. Good. So, so I think the point, hopefully you get the point is we are required to keep track when we are doing the annual work to keep track. Hopefully your easiest case is nothing changed. We just depleted. Um, that's a very easy case, right? You just report the change and it's simply last year we had 10 million. This year we have 9 million because we produced 1 million. That, that's a very easy uh, case to do, but when there are other things going on, uh, that's that's a more complicated uh, factor. So thank you for participating in that. So again, moving on in the rules, this is also an important one that it, the ASS rules requires the company to provide a summary of the governance and governance arrangements and internal controls that the entity has put in place with respect to. Uh, it's estimated of resources and reserves. And to me, the biggest risk factor here is when companies say, this is what we do, and then we don't follow that. Okay, so let me give you an example. There's a report I've seen, and I, I will not name the, the company. It's a large company. Uh, actually, this project is a joint venture with some major companies in there. And in the technical report, there's an updated technical report, I believe, that's updated from a 2015 report to a 2020, uh, a 2018 report, if I'm not, the dates don't matter. But, but in this report, they clearly state in the previous one that for every 20 samples, this is in the QC Kiwi part, for every 20 samples that is sent to the lab, there's two of them, two samples that are either a blank or, um, or a standard, right, that I added in as part of the QCQ protocol. And they describe all this protocol. In the updated report, they admit themselves that in the last few years, we have not been following our protocol. That's a disaster waiting to happen. That's material information. And if I'm an investor or a group of investors who lose money because the reserve estimates turned out to be wrong, those investors are going to say, you told us that for every 20 samples you send to the lab, you do have standards and you do have blanks in there that help you understand the risk associated with the lab's performance. And then you stop doing that. And we were never told you were not doing that. And if that's the source of your estimates being wrong, I deserve to be compensated for losing money because I invested in your company with the assumption that you have a rigorous QCQA protocol. Now, at the global level, it may not look like that. At the global level, the annual report will say things like, oh, we make sure our work is supervised by QPs. Some companies disclose that every five years, we bring in an external consultant to review our approaches, so on and so forth. And the company discloses things they do to ensure that the resource and, uh, uh, and reserve estimate, the process is accurate. The point I'm making here is, when you disclose what you are doing to ensure that these numbers are accurate, you better be doing them at each of the mines because if you are not doing them, that is liability that an investor can sue you on the basis of because you are telling the market, we are doing one thing to ensure that the results are reliable and not doing that. That is what, whatever the reasons for not doing that, from an investor standpoint, that is material. Um, you disclose the process and then you ended up doing something else. And to the extent that that led to uh, undervaluation or mistakes in the valuation of the property, that's, that's a big deal. So um, that's a big caution here is to understand what your company is disclosing and if that needs to be updated, then let's update that. But we need to be doing what we are saying in these report that these reports that we are doing as far as governance arrangements and internal controls are concerned. If we disclose that QPs are trained, we need to train the QPs. If we disclose that certain numbers are signed on by QPs, they need to be signed on by QPs. We need to be doing what we are, we are disclosing. 
Um, notice also the quick comment on reference to Appendix 5A, which is JOC, as I have said already. I wanted to pause quickly and give a, sh a shout out to the fact that the ASS listing rules requires a competent person. Um, I'm not going to go through much of this, but you notice that it does say a market announcement uh, by an entity that contains exploration results or resources and reserves um, must be based on uh, and fairly re represent a QP's uh, work. Um, this is the same across uh, the other codes so that a QP must be supervising or doing the work in order for it to be stated in these disclosures. Um, typically, first time disclosure requires detailed disclosure, things like a job table one report or a competent person's report to justify the disclosure but for subsequent ones, to the extent that there have been no material changes, then we don't need to provide that level. We can rely on the, the old um, disclosure to provide subsequent disclosure. Okay, um, I think I'm about on time. So I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about production target requirements and then we'll open the floor for Q and A. Um, so production target requirements, so again, uh, chapter five of the ASX listing rules, uh, 516, uh, does say that um, a public report by an entity condition, uh, containing production target, which relates to resources and reserves. Um, and also if the property or the project is a material, uh, then must include the following um, note that it says material assumptions must be disclosed. So if you're providing a production target, which companies do provide often to say this coming year, we are going to produce a million ounces of gold. If you're producing that, then you need to provide the material assumptions. Um, and so that's the first point, 16-1. Uh, um, and then 16.2, says that it, you also need to provide a statement that the estimated reserves and resources underpinning the production target have been prepared by a competent person. Again, going back to the competent person and that they follow the requirements of JOG, right? So not only have they been done by a competent person, they are consistent with JOG in terms of what is a resource, what is a reserve, what are the different classes of resources and reserves. Um, so some best practices, in my opinion, are to ensure that uh, the material assumptions are disclosed. Um, and if, they are, if you have disclosed those before, just check to make sure that they are still valid the way you make your assumptions. Uh, communicate these changes through the change. So if changes have happened in geology, the engineering people need to know and management needs to know. These, everybody needs to be aware of things that have happened so that uh, we can report the right assumptions. Um, and then I've already mentioned this, make sure to follow the governance and internal controls protocols, even in advice and on production targets. So, so with that, I've come to the end of my prepared remarks, which would be the big takeaways in my opinion, is that the securities law and the listing rules of the markets we operate in mandate annual mineral resource, mineral reserve, um, disclosure. Um, so it's serious business, uh, whether QPs or CPs have a role in this as an expert. Um, and these rules are designed to ensure that the involvement of the external or someone with expertise is to ensure that JOC is followed in the case of ASX, for example, or in, in 43101 that the CIM standard is followed. Uh, part of why we do that is to say this person has the experience and the expertise to do it right. And so think about that, that that is what is being sold to investors that because you are a qualified person doing that, you have the expertise to do it right. And if you are not doing it right, then that's a problem. It is the equivalent. In fact, I know this much more for the US and, and of course, as many of you probably know, you are much, much more likely to be sued in the US over these things than in other jurisdictions. 
And in the US rules, the way the liability part for experts is written, it's actually outside of the rules we wrote at all. It, it, in, in section 11 of securities law, it says that um, when the registrant relies on experts and it actually says experts such as account, uh, attorneys, accountants, engineers, and scientists. And so from the SEC standpoint, the reasons why QPs are liable is that law. It's not just because they are QPs. It's actually because that law says experts such as attorneys, accountants, engineers, and scientists, when they do provide expert disclosure, then the expert is now liable, not the company. And so think about the way the company uses an auditor's report and that auditor can be sued by investors for not doing their job well. This is the, the same level of uh, importance that is attached to a QP technical report summary under the US, the new US rules. It, the, the statutory authority of the SEC on that is the exact same thing. The same level of scrutiny that is attached to an auditor's report is the same level of scrutiny that is attached to a QP's work. And so we need to take this um, as, as something serious. Um, and that's my next bullet that QPs must act with the highest ethical and professional uh, standard. Some best practices um, to do is do your work, uh, whether the estimates or the classification should be consistent with the applicable codes. We've been talking about JOC today uh, and ensure that the reports that you prepare are in compliance with those uh, codes. Uh, and then ensure that the internal controls that your company is disclosing is being followed and actually there's proper documentation that those are being followed. Um, I just also wanted to point out for those of you that um, are interested um, that we will have a, a training session, Sphinx, my consulting business, will have a training session in late March. Um, uh, it will be a, a four day training session and then I'll give this, the participant the project at the end of which the project has always been something people really enjoy. They get each group gets assigned a particular company and they review the annual reports and then they come back and do presentations. Um, so that would be in a week's time from the main instructional portion of the course. So if that's something you're looking for further training, um, definitely um, let me know or uh, go to my website and